All right, we look forward to having two great plenary speakers today. Uh, the first plenary speaker is Solomon David. He's going to be presenting a talk on modern conservation insights from ancient fishes. Dr. Solomon David is an aquatic ecologist and assistant professor at Nichols State University who is interested in fish biodiversity, conservation, and science communication. As principal investigator at Gar Lab, his current research focuses on the ecology of ancient fishes and how those species can help us better understand and conserve aquatic ecosystems. Additional projects involve conservation of Great Lakes, migratory fishes, and peripheral, peripheral populations of species. He also communicates science through traditional and social media to raise awareness of the value of aquatic ecosystems and freshwater biodiversity. So please help me in welcoming Solomon David. Thank you very much. Just get my time here. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dan, and uh, thank you all for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today. It's been great to uh, uh, hear from so many great speakers, so many you know talks. Um, it's been great to reconnect with you all after uh, years of kind of doing things virtually and maybe not having that same connection. So that's uh, really been great uh, to do. So, as uh, are we not getting in? Hear me okay? All right. Um, as Dan said, I'm going to be talking about modern conservation insights from ancient fishes. So that's uh, kind of an interesting juxtaposition, I hope. Um, if you're interested in the work that we do, you can follow us uh, on Twitter at uh, my handle there or our lab. But right out the gates, I want to uh, give a shout out to the home team, uh, my wife Casey and uh, my two kids, Cecilia and Ben. They're kind of holding down the fort um, and they've put up with the uh, interest and obsession with these ancient fishes um, for several years now. Several years for Casey and all of their lives for the other two. Um, also to my graduate students, or graduate students if you will, um, my current students up at the top there, Audrey Bates, Dinah Kador, who presented here today and did a uh, at the meeting and did a great job. Katie Wright who's also in attendance and I've got some alumni there. Um, I didn't say they had to have pictures with a gar for all of them but it just so happens that they end up doing that so it's good to have a team effort there. So the theme of this meeting is what do fish mean to us and so I wanted to kind of keep that theme going and hopefully by now we have some different perspectives thinking about what do fish mean to us but I want you to think about that to yourself um, while I'm also giving you my story. So part of what I'm going to be talking about today is my perspective on what some of these fish mean to me. And maybe you've got some stories of your own for how you got to be doing what you're doing in fisheries and conservation and management um, for what fish mean to you. And I also want you to think about management and stewardship. So stewardship fits within the context of management, but stewardship is using care for management caring about whatever that is, that resource in this particular case. So those are the two main things, but I also have this sort of concept to think about. And it isn't necessarily anything new. I think it's a pretty broad concept, but this is what I wanted to go back to um, over today's talk. Diverse fishes and diverse voices. So when I'm talking about diverse fishes, I'm talking about biodiversity, conservation, management. Having that diversity there is important. Diverse voices. So with diverse voices, we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, representation, and how these two sort of ideas or entities can help each other out. By looking at more diverse fishes, we can hear from more diverse voices. We involve more people that are interested or rely on these different resources, and so we can hear from more people that way. By hearing from more diverse voices, we can learn more about a diversity of fishes and hopefully manage them better, conserve them better. So it's that sort of feedback loop that I'd like you to also keep in mind. So what do fish mean to you? I'm gonna be talking about what some of these fish mean to me, but thinking about this diverse fishes and diverse voices, and thinking about management and stewardship. So those are sort of the high level things that I'm gonna be talking about. So 
what do fish mean to us or what do ancient fish mean to us? Um, again, I'm giving that perspective from my viewpoint, some of the things that uh, I've experienced and have worked on um, also with my team. And then secondarily, I'm going to be talking about insights from three different areas, science, policy, and for the future. So trying to keep things relatively broad and I'm going to introduce maybe some papers and some ideas, but I'm introducing those topics to you to hopefully you can take a look at them further on your own. I'm not going to dive deep into the numbers too much, but for the first part, I want to talk about what do ancient fish mean to us? And I've got to go back to what do fish mean to me? And um, although I'm from Louisiana now, I've been there for six years, I was actually born in Washington State in Arlington, Washington, not far from Seattle. And uh, my dad took this picture a few years ago when he was able to visit. And sure enough, on the sign for the hometown, there's these Salmonids there, so it's kind of cool to have that connection back to water and to fish. When I was a kid, I only lived here for about three years, we would go to the Stillaguamish River and my dad would, you know, have me skipping stones across the river, so there's some early connections there. Moving forward, as a kid, we eventually moved to North Dakota and then down to Ohio. Over all of that time, I was interested in creatures insects, reptiles, amphibians, kind of the creepy crawlies or maybe not always the warm and fuzzy organisms. Um, as a kid, I was always interested in dinosaurs, so that was what kind of helped get me into nature as well. And when I moved to Ohio, some uh, friends of mine, they realized that I was interested in these creatures in the outdoors, and they gave me some old back issues of a nature magazine called Ranger Rick. Some of you might be familiar with what that is. It's put out by the National Wildlife Federation. And uh, I was flipping through one of those back issues, so I didn't have any, a subscription of my own. These are old magazines. And I flipped to the middle of one of them, and I see this giant fish that looks like an alligator with fins instead of legs. And some of you that either know me or maybe have heard of these fish know what we're talking about. Alligator gar here. It has this very prehistoric, primitive look to it. It reminded me of my favorite dinosaur, T-Rex, with this giant head, lots of teeth. I learned that they've been around since the time of the dinosaurs. Um, they've got all these really cool adaptations. So I thought, wow, this is really cool. I was about, I don't know, 11 years old. So I thought that was neat. Um, I just emblazoned that article and that uh, image on my mind. I eventually lost that article and that became a whole other quest, but uh, still it made that impact. Moving forward to graduate school at University of Michigan, I was able to integrate um, long nose gars um, with my master's thesis and for my dissertation I was able to work on spotted gars. Just as an aside, since I know this is salmon country, I did a thesis that included long nose gars and Chinook salmon. You don't see those two in combo very often, so I do have ties back to Salmonids still. Um, I did my dissertation on spotted gars and um, while I was getting ready to defend, my dad digged up an old illustration that I did um, when I was 12, and it was of a spotted gar. So, you know, I would say it's relatively spot on, or, you know, maybe it's foreshadowing, gar shadowing, I don't know. But uh, so it was neat to have kind of those roots tied back to, you know, those early impressions of, uh, of these fish. Fast forward to a conference I came down to in a small town called Thibodeau, Louisiana. We're actually at Southern Division in New Orleans. Met with some prof uh, professors that were from Thibodeau and they said, at the end of the conference, we're gonna go sampling for some fish. You wanna go with us? And uh, I said, I gotta get back up to Ann Arbor. I can't do that. Um, but just out of curiosity, what are you gonna be working on? They're like, we're gonna be going after alligator gar. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've never seen these fish in the wild. I changed my flight. And uh, it was January um, of 2009, and we were able to get out there and we got some alligator gar for some of the work they were doing. But it was neat to kind of reconnect with this fish that had got me interested into fish way back when I was 11 years old. So it was kind of neat to come, you know, finish that little bit of an, of an arc there. So that's kind of the background on what these fish mean to me. Speaking more broadly, what do fish mean to us? And here I'm focusing on freshwater fishes, but we can apply some of this to marine fishes, of course, too. But thinking about fish diversity, freshwater and marine together, there's over 35,000 species. So all kinds of diversity there. Impossible for any one person to know all of those species, which is why we need diverse voices, diverse fishes. Whether it comes to conservation or representation, diverse voices for diverse fishes. Over half of the known fish are in a very small amount of the planet's water, and these freshwater fish are important as food for over 200 million people. And the recreational fishery is also highly valuable. I encourage you to look at um, WWF's report that came out last year, The World's Forgotten Fishes. They do a great job with the visuals and the stats on this, but fish are very important to all of us and oftentimes in different ways too. Ancient fishes. 
So I'm not going to get into any sort of phylogenetics or non-teleost actinipterygians and get into some you know, uh, jargon there. But some examples of what we might call ancient fishes or what are sometimes called living fossils. These fish that have been around for a long time, their lineages trace back sometimes even before the dinosaurs. Um, and the representatives alive today look very similar to those you'd see in the fossil record. So the uh, Pacific lamprey that you see on the upper left, the bowfin on the right, the paddlefish, and the white sturgeon, which of course is a native species just like the Pacific lamprey is here. So these are our ancient fishes. They've been around for a long time, don't seem to have changed much. They've seen a lot of change, and it's interesting and impressive that they're still able to survive and persist you know, during the time of humans. Within that group, we've got the gars, and so they're another group of ancient fishes. Here's a fossil gar. Gars have been around since about the late Jurassic period, 157 million years ago. And so uh, an illustration by one of my favorite uh, artists, Ray Troll, had done this, gar versus velociraptor. I guess it could happen. Um, but they haven't changed much. They've got these ganoid scales that are made up of something like tooth enamel. They're super tough. Um, some indigenous peoples would make arrowheads out of the scales. Um, even different types of covers and uh, other materials that are still used today. And uh, so they're very durable, you know, very, uh, very impressive fish. If you fast forward to what they look like today, they haven't changed a whole lot. You're talking about millions and millions of years ago, and a fossil gar and a spotted gar here today looks basically the same. They haven't changed a whole lot. They found a way to survive. They found a plan that works. Um, all they need to do is worry about surviving through, you know, us. So, and that's a challenge. Um, because they've got these tough scales and, you know, a colonialist perspective treats them as not as highly valuable as some other game fish that our modern fisheries, you know, sees as valuable. So they're oftentimes considered trash fish. I hate using the garbage fish pun, but it's still there, so I got to say it. But with the advent of bow fishing, spear fishing, different types of technology, harvest gets pretty excessive in some cases. It's not unusual to see gars piled up that have been killed because anglers don't think they have any sort of value. They're harder to clean. It's not like cleaning a bluegill or a trout. You've got to get tin snips to get through those scales. So um, it's challenging. There's tournaments where they kill these by the hundreds or thousands, and then they just dump them into landfills. So not making much use out of them. So there's a long way to go with conservation of these fishes, diverse fishes and diverse voices. There's even the electric gar destroyer. So management even was, you know, trying to keep a bearing on these fish. This is from the 1930s. I was talking to Patrick Cooney from Smith Root. He thinks that this might be the first example of electrofishing in the United States, but it was made to kill those gar because they're bad. Um, the boat's not any longer around, but the gars still are, so that's good. But so even management. Um, I think up until the 80s, in some states, if you caught a gar, it was illegal to throw it back into the water alive. You had to snap that back and then, you know, maybe then you could throw it back into the water. So they've got a long way to go. I like to think we're working with a future generation. These are some of my biology of fishes students at Nichols. Um, and here we've got another Salmonid gar, you know, comparison here. Um, early on, I have them introduced to gars, and they've also got rainbow trout. You can take a look at this and figure out which one's more slimy. And yet they're still smiling. I at least like that. But very different fish than your trout and your salmon and your bass. So, it makes things challenging when we're thinking about conservation of diverse fishes. But uh, again, the students get to know these fish, and I like to think that um, it, um, it helps out moving forward. So I want to switch now to thinking about these insights in these different categories, science, policy, and for the future. And I'm not going to go terribly deep into those, but I want to give some examples that maybe you can move forward and look into those. Um, one of the papers that was put out in 2021 by uh, Andrew Ripple and a, a great team. It was a privilege to work with them. Um, Miranda Bell Tilcock, uh, Matt Miller from the Nature Conservancy, I know Katie O'Reilly is here. It was great working with that team to look at rough fish. What does rough fish mean? It generally is going to mean these fishes of lesser value or that we as managers have deemed to be of lesser value or historically are lesser value. And I say historically because historically only to a point. It's basically around the time of colonization when these things started to go south for a lot of these native fishes. Indigenous peoples have maintained these native fishes as high value for a long, long time. So we wanted to look into shifting that paradigm. Rough fish is this sort of negative term that indicates lesser value 
for native species. And so you can see some examples here. We've got paddlefish, we've got suckers, we've got the bowfin. Um, some of them have had this improved uh, reputation. It's, it's getting better, but we give some suggestions as how to improve that type of management, improve that reputation. And it fits in with this idea of if we can listen to more diverse voices, we can better conserve more diverse fishes. And we also got an alligator gar on the cover for, of fisheries. So I think it's the first gar on the cover of fisheries in the history of the, uh, of the publication, so that was kind of neat. But if we look at the science and the research, there's a stark lack of research relative to game fish. And uh, the rainbow trout um, is at the top here. They looked at all of the publications that AFS puts out, all the research up until 2019, searched, uh, I think, 28 species of game fish, 27 species of uh, non-game or rough fish, and nine more that were these sort of escapees, they found that for, on average, for those game fish, there was 11 times more research, more studies done on these game fish than on the non-game fish, or these rough fish. Um, five times more research than these escapees, which are like rough fish that kind of got their reputation a little bit better. Um, the number one fish, rainbow trout, out of the top five fish, you can see those green bars at the top, the top five Four of the five are salmonids. You can guess what that other one is? Largemouth bass, of course. So we've got a long way to go to look into those other species. And we also found that those other species are of great value to indigenous people, other persons of color. They're the ones that are using these other fishes that are oftentimes deemed of lesser value. So we introduce ways to hopefully improve uh, management and conservation of those fishes. So improving diverse fishes by listening to more diverse voices. Some examples from policy, and uh, this is where I want you to come back to thinking about stewardship a little bit, the idea of management and stewardship, that relationship. So going back to bow fishing and thinking about stewardship of our natural resources, um, there is a Facebook group, uh, Oklahoma Bow Fishing Madness. They had some people on there that had bow fished a ton of these gars, and their, their question was, how many do you think are fitting in the bottom of this boat? Um, so you can see these piles of, and any of you know what a phoenix boat is, you know that's a pretty large hold in that boat. And then you can see in the other picture, filled up. And then they posted a video of them counting all the fish, and there were over a thousand gars that they'd shot. And the video is them just tossing them back into the water. So they weren't eating them. I've had gar, gar's tasty, I like it. But they're just throwing them back in the water. So not only were they just tossing them in the water, it's sort of a you know, wasteful use, if you can call it that, but they also videoed it and put it on social media. So that got into some of the wrong hands. Uh, probably me is one of the wrong hands there. And so we'd posted about it. Luckily, Oklahoma De uh, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries um, was on top of it as well. And they saw the video, and plenty of people reported it to them. And they ended up getting fined. And so at least that was some progress, because we see this all over with a lot of different bow fishing tournaments or a lot of different bow fishers. There's plenty of great bow fishers out there that eat what they shoot, what they kill, but there's also a lot of this waste that goes on. But if you look at this, $3,000 in fines and one lost fishing privileges for six months, but that was essentially for improper disposal of the fish remains. So it wasn't even for killing over 1,000 fish for no reason other than just killing them. But the real penalty that we have on the books right now is that they disposed of them improperly. So we have a long way to go to conserve these diverse fishes. And luckily, when we've got social media, it's obviously a double-edged sword, but we could hear from some diverse voices, multi-species anglers, people that just saw these pictures and thought, this isn't right. Is this good stewardship of natural resources? That was in Oklahoma. We can move further up north to Minnesota and uh, some Ice fishers were uh, using uh, spears and some new high-tech um, sort of fish finders. And they were killing all these gars through the ice. And of course, they videotaped it and posted it to YouTube. Got in the wrong hands, I guess. There's my comment right there. They had over 80 gars they piled on the ice, you know, did some videos of that, um, and then they just dumped them in the woods. So is that good stewardship? Is that good use of our natural resources? It's legal. But is that a good use of our natural resources? Is that using care for management of our natural resources? I would say no. I would disagree that it's good stewardship. And luckily, that information got to some representatives in Minnesota. Uh, Representative Becker Fenn had posted that they were going to introduce um, into a new bill some sort of limit for GARs. 
She'd seen the video people had sent and said, like, this isn't right. And I saw that via Twitter, and I, I was like, I was very excited they were going to interview this, do away with them as trash fish. And uh, so I messaged her and I said, what info can I send? So I sent her the few papers that exist about this. We're, we're doing better, but there's still not as many as there are on Bass or Salmani. So I sent her the papers, I sent her the blog post. She had the scientific evidence. Dennis Skarniecki's paper from 1992, a reappraisal of gars and bowfins in fisheries management, a classic paper, sent her that. And she used that to promote this idea of limits for gars. And so that was immediately integrated into their sort of policy in the hearing that they had, and it passed. And so now Minnesota DNR has to set some sort of limit for gar. They're not official game fish, but a limit, something is better than nothing. That way we don't have this unlimited harvest of a natural resource. It seems like that's probably not the, uh, the best way to go with an unlimited use for a resource, especially when we don't know enough about it, whether we're going to reach a tipping point, when we're going to run out, what impacts they might have. And it got into the, uh, the media. They had a fun article that I was able to um, contribute to. But again, we've got these diverse voices through social media in this case, but also going back to the scientific evidence, working with politicians. It was neat to see policy get implemented in a matter of weeks about this. So um, you don't really, when you're working with GAR, not very much moves very fast, including the fish themselves. But uh, it, was, it was neat to see that. There's also research that's being done on bow fishing. Uh, Jason Schooley and Dennis Garnecki are doing some great work looking at bow fishing management and trying to come up with recommendations there. It's, a, it's an ongoing process, but uh, um, I think there is headway being made. So again, you can take a look at some of these articles uh, in fisheries and also um, some other publications. But again, the work is being done. It's, a, it's just a process moving forward with that. So now I want to shift to think about insights for the future. Diverse voices, diverse fishes, looking ahead. What does that mean? Diverse voices, when we're thinking about diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, representation. These are my kids, they have to stare at guard tanks all the time, but you know, I figured that was a good future reference. Um, back in 2020, there was some concern about um, rep, uh, representation and diversity in our profession. And uh, it was really disconcerting to a lot of us. And so, you know, I wanted to look at how can we move this in a positive direction. And so for me, my outlet tends to be Twitter. So I tweeted out, let's show what the diverse faces of fish science look like. And so I said, you know, just comment with what you do and, you know, we can, we can share that and see how that goes. Um, and it was a great response that we got. I had to say thank you to a lot of people for that, and it was, it was great to get that because it, it lifted me up, and I felt like it lifted a lot of others up that were wondering, what does diversity, what does representation look like in our field? And this is just 128 of the images and responses we got back, but you can look at the broad colors, the, the fishes, everything. Um, it was great to get that response from all types of people. And when I have up there reaching the next generations, Next generation can be a relative term. Um, for some people, maybe I'm the next generation. For me, maybe it's my grad students are the next generation. My kids are the next generation. I think by integrating these diverse voices, diverse fishes, we can more broadly and effectively reach out to the next generation and hopefully be better stewards of our natural resources. I had a couple examples more specifically. Um, Aaron Spencer is a member of AFS. We were on the SciComm section together. Put out a book for kids about coral reefs. And you can see the reasoning behind uh, why she wanted to do that. Bring peer-reviewed science to kids in a fun, accessible, bite-sized way. And also there's the illustrations there. So you've got this next generation or early career scientist also looking ahead to whatever the next generation is after them or after us. How can we reach that next generation? integrate more diverse voices. Um, Alexander Vidal is an illustrator, a Latino illustrator, and also an anthropologist. Um, we'd been in touch as he was writing this book, Wilds of the United States. So we went to a bunch of national parks and other um, sort of protected areas throughout the United States and wanted to introduce readers to this you know, broad diversity of our wildlife that we have. And not just buffalo and not just grizzly bears, but he even wanted the more you know, unique, lesser known species. So he's got some interesting insects in the book and some um, interesting small mammals. And of course, if we uh, flip to part of that book, you can see a paddlefish, an alligator gar, some sturgeon there. So I think uh, he did a great job, again, bringing that diversity of fishes um, to that next generation. So I think that's important. Diverse voices and diverse fishes. 
And speaking of illustrations with alligator gars, um, I was working on a project uh, when I was a postdoc at Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and National Wildlife Federation put out a tweet that, uh, that said it was National Raccoon Day. And it had this recognizable raccoon, it was Ranger Rick, the mascot for Ranger Rick. And so I'd been looking for that article for ages, and uh, um, I think it was almost 20 years at that point. So I thought, maybe I should just tweet to them. I said, hey, Ranger Rick is how I got into GARS. I've been looking for this article for forever. Um, and I went home, the next day they tweeted to me, and they sent me back, is this the image of that article? And so I thought, oh my gosh, I've been looking for this forever. Um, it was really exciting to be kind of reconnected with that. I saved it everywhere, so I, that way I couldn't lose it. Like, I've got a PDF, I'm scanning it, whatever, sending it to all my friends, I'm sending people that aren't my friends. Um, so it was neat to be reconnected with that after all those years. And they had one more copy of it left, so they sent me that copy, and uh, it's hanging up in my office, so it was kind of neat to come full circle with that. So. Coming back to the main things that we want to talk about. What do fish mean to us? I've told you what some of these fish mean to me and hopefully introduce you to some new ways we can think about management and stewardship and more broadly diverse fishes and diverse voices. If we do better at integrating more species, better biodiversity when we think about fisheries management, we're also going to be listening to more diverse voices, including others in these decisions, hopefully better decisions for the future. So some broad recommendations, I would say, to support science on native fishes. Um, the Ripple et al. paper has some great recommendations on top of this one, but maybe it's an opportunity to just share out about, you know, Maybe it's a cool fact about, I don't know, central mud minnows or pirate perch or something, as opposed to using another paper about a well-known game fish. Um, but diversifying what we use maybe in our classes or maybe what we share on social media or maybe what we want to go out and fish for. Um, and then also support diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. AFS is doing a great job with the push for that. I, uh, um, I commend AFS for doing that. Uh, my co-chair for the DEI committee, um, Chelsea Crandall, she carried us through that to this past year. Um, and then. Um, uh, Leon with the uh, uh, EOS section, they do great work. Get involved if you want to be involved with DEI. Or maybe just share out what they're doing. Talk to somebody about it. Maybe read up about it on your own. Look further into that diverse voices. And speak out. It doesn't have to be speak out in public. It doesn't have to be speak out on social media. Maybe it's speak out to EOS people. Or maybe speak out to the fisheries management section. There are safe spaces here where you can talk to other people if you're interested in how do we integrate more biodiversity in fisheries management? Or how do we improve our representation, our diversity, equity, inclusion? There are people here that you can contact. You can feel free to contact me, and I can refer you to different uh, folks. But I think speaking out is also important. Um, or if you just want to you know, get involved with the thralls of the online stuff, speak out against the bow fishing stuff. That's kind of what I've been doing for a while. And so finally, I want to leave you with one last fish tale. And uh, um, this is uh, just a couple years ago. It's a story about a brown kid in New Jersey reading a magazine, and uh, he's flipping through it, and uh, he sees something cool. And uh, he goes over to his dad and says, like, Dad, you've got to see this. There's this Indian guy, and he's holding this really weird fish. And it was this picture. And uh, his dad says, that's your cousin, man. That's your cousin. And so these are family members I hadn't seen in a long time, especially due to COVID. And uh, it was just neat to kind of come full circle with that, maybe introduce a new generation to conservation, diversity, representation matters. And they in included some other stuff um, in that article, going back to that original article, they include some of our lab. And uh, so it was neat to kind of reach that next generation. And uh, with apologies to my current and future co-authors, Ranger Rick has a circulation of over 520,000 and 200,000 more on these back issues. So that's going to get way more reads than anything I put out in the scientific literature. So I'm happy to work with any of you all, but I'm not going to be able to top that. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, thank the um, uh, organizations that helped with this work over the many years um, and the many people that were involved with that. Um, thank you for listening. And with that, I will say a gargantuan thank you.